Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Backer and welcome to Write Better Stories. Today joining me as my co-host is one Pringle Backer. And today we are going to talk about this collection of short stories called Thus Were Their Faces by Silvina Ocampo. And I don't know a whole lot about her life, but I do know that she's often considered to be sort of overshadowed within that camp of Argentine writers that um, were contemporaries of Borges. And I know that she knew Borges and she was married to... I, I know I'm not saying that name right, but um, she wrote this book of short stories that I think is really interesting. And a lot of the imagery really checks a lot of my boxes. So it's something that's very preoccupied with dreams and people telling the future and reincarnation and philosophy and different religious undertones. And all of this is done in sort of like an old fashioned way too. So it doesn't come across necessarily as fantasy. The literary element, I think, overpowers the fantasy element of it so that it doesn't feel too much like genre fiction. And so I really liked a lot of the mood of a lot of these pieces. Um, I will say on the flip side though, that since these are short stories, some of them are not really as conclusive as I usually like a story to be. And I think to be fair, that's usually what short stories can get away with is just occupying a certain mood or a certain scene and not necessarily giving the reader a whole lot of answers or conclusive results to the imagery that they're exploring. Some of these stories are more conclusive than others. And so even though I liked a lot of the imagery in this collection, um, there were, were many times that I just kind of felt like I wasn't that eager to investigate it more because I wasn't uh, going to be given any kind of like conclusive happening at the end. But probably the longest and most conclusive short story in this collection is called The Imposter. And this is about a boy named Luis who goes and visits Armando, this very troubled boy on a farm, and they have a lot of very trippy encounters. And so I'm going to do a reading from that short story. But first, I'm going to do a reading from the titular short story, Thus Were Their Faces. I think this one had the most provocative imagery and it sort of defies interpretation or I think that actually in a positive way, I didn't really feel the need to interpret it. I liked just how trippy and weird the imagery was and I just let it wash over me. And so sort of on the upshot to what I said about there not being a lot of definitive conclusions to these short stories, at its best when that happened, it seemed to occupy a sort of dream logic that didn't necessarily demand any kind of direct explication. So I'm gonna start out with that reading from Thus Were Their Faces. And this does, I think, spoil the story. So if you don't wanna have it spoiled for you, then you can turn this off now. But um, it does happen kind of toward the end, but I just thought this was a very interesting and evocative passage. The news in the papers appeared like this. Forty children from a school for the deaf were flying back from their first vacation by the sea when their plane suffered a terrible accident. A door mysteriously opened during the flight and caused the disaster. Only the teachers, the pilot, and the crew were saved. When interviewed, Miss Fabia Hernandez said, with conviction, that when the children threw themselves into the void, they had wings. She tried to hold back the last child who escaped from her arms to follow the others as if an angel. She said the intense beauty of the scene convinced her that it wasn't a disaster, but rather some kind of celestial vision she will never forget. She still doesn't believe in the children's disappearance. So this was basically the end or one of the final paragraphs to this story after it follows all of these children like a mob kind of going into these uh, various states of consciousness as a group and parading around town and um, sort of confusing the elders. And I just thought that was such a beautiful image of all of these children in a plane, like willingly throwing themselves out, but they had wings and, and it wasn't a tragedy. This was their transcendence in some way. So I thought that was just really beautiful and I wanted to share that. Um, but also, one of the things that it's said about this collection, but then also about Silvina Ocampo's writing in general, is just like how dark and dreary it is. And a lot of 
the stories depict cruelty, and I think they even describe cruelty as like one of her main themes. And so I think maybe at the time that she was writing some of these, and this these stories span many decades, but it's like basically from the late 30s to the late 80s. Um, maybe at some time for some of these stories that would have been really edgy. I found it kind of tiresome. Some of the stories just seemed to just go bleak and, and not in any way that really felt like it was informing us about the human condition as much as it was just being like, oh, here, here's a, a dark character who's being pre presented. I bet they're going to kill someone or revel in someone's death at some point. And so a lot of these stories do tend to go that way. Um, I don't think that that is like completely devastating to the book. It's really interesting and the best stories in this are very much worth reading. But I think having read so many of them in a row, after characters would die at the end or people would have to encounter all of these dreary themes, I was just kind of like, it, it ceased to be surprising and was just kind of expected at a certain point. But I'm going to go ahead and do that reading now from The Imposter. And this has some interesting philosophical themes that I will talk about afterward. The rosy clouds assumed the annoying shapes of angels and altars. Above the grass, the remains of the mist dispersed. In the faint light of the woods, slow, blind Apollo appeared, the horse with a star on its forehead. It was the first time I had seen a blind animal. I prepared this phrase to tell Aradia. A person who is capable of talking, of understanding, of reasoning, even if he is born blind, can come to know the world of forms and colors through words, through thought. But a blind animal, what secret labyrinths can it know, a prisoner of its movements, like an automaton? What hands, what kind voice will reveal the world to it? I said, animals are the dreams of nature. So I thought that was interesting because so much of this story does concern things that go on in the characters' minds. And I will spoil this story right now, so go ahead and turn it off if you don't want this spoiled for you, because this story does have one of the more conclusive endings. At the end, you find out that Luis was a projection of Armando's mind, and there, there was no Luis at all. And so... This is an interesting passage because it just makes us question through the eyes of this blind horse, where do thoughts come from and how do we end up coming up with stable concepts? And if you didn't have words, then would you be able to have thoughts or any kind of understanding of the world? And what, what does that experience mean if you don't have words? So this is pretty well-worn territory for anyone film, uh, familiar with postmodern writing or postmodern philosophy or fiction. But I think what's interesting about this is it does make us engage that question of if you can have thoughts or experiences without words. And I know a lot of people think, no, Wittgenstein's famous quote is something along the lines of the world is all that the case is, or the world is all that is the case, or I, I always kind of mess it up. But I personally think, yes, you can have thoughts, and you guys will have to let me know if you think that I am right about this or not. So for like one of the examples that I can give is that if you're watching a movie and there's a surprise ending, usually when that surprise takes place, it's an enormous density of information that you're experiencing in a flash that you don't necessarily put into words in your head. You would have to put it into words if you were going to tell it to somebody else, but as it's being shown to you, and as you realize it as a viewer, I think that all happens in a flash and it doesn't happen with words. It's just you're putting together the information in a non-linguistic way. Now, I get that you could argue that maybe all of this information is still being presented to you through the textual information on the screen, and not textual as in words, but textual as in like the symbolic information that the images of the movie are showing you, but again, Personally, I think that, like, for example, at the end of The Sixth Sense, when you realize, along with Bruce Willis, that he was a ghost the whole time, I think that this happens in a moment, and the words are not necessarily happening in your head. So there's a longer de debate to be had about that, and I don't think that's the final word on that by any means. But sometimes I think that, even though I'm very interested in postmodern philosophy and different ways of looking at language and how that affects the world, I think that people draw too hard of a line in saying that everything in our experience is reduced to words and anything that would be outside of words is somehow nonsense. But 
the blind horse in this uh, scene gives us some sense of the idea of consciousness without words. And even though it doesn't necessarily show it to us, because how would you show animal conscious anyway, let alone blind animal consciousness, it just makes us contemplate that like this horse is still moving around. It's still having some kind of an experience. Um, it's not speaking English or any other language like that, but it is still experiencing horsiness. So there, there must be something going on inside of there. And so naturally that makes us extrapolate to not just about animal consciousness, but about our own consciousness. And since these two characters who end up being one character in the end are having this um, conflict throughout the story of Luis trying to communicate his dreams to Armando and realizing that there's this chasm of experience separating them, that it seems that there is a lot more going on inside of us than just words, even if we can't necessarily communicate that to another person. 